Keaton Otis was shot to death by Portland police near the Lloyd Center in 2010. Police say they pulled him over because he wore a hoodie and sped away from them when they moved their vehicle behind his. Tonight is the monthly Keaton Otis Vigil, starting at 6 p.m. and held at the street corner where he was killed, Northeast 6th in Halsey. Here to talk. Thanks for being here, Joanne. It's my pleasure. First, can you recount uh, what happened to Keaton that night on May 12th? In 2010? Yes. Um, <clears throat> May 12th, uh, 2010, around 6 p.m., uh, Keaton Otis was driving his mother's car near Lloyd Center. Uh, gang enforcement officers in plain clothes pulled up behind him uh, and noticed him and said that he, because he had a hoodie on, and what they considered a very warm day because he was driving a car that didn't appear to fit him, they started following him. And as what happens with most people, if you're being followed by the police, you're gonna make a mistake. And so he changed lanes without signaling and that was their reason for pulling him over. Once they pulled him over, uh, the situation escalated uh, almost immediately. Um, and within a matter of a couple of minutes, he had been tased three times by three different officers. He had been shot 26 times. Uh, and the police version of what happened was when they pulled him over, they say he became belligerent and started cursing him out. He, they say he reached into a glove compartment, pulled out a Crown Royal bag, opened a Crown Royal bag, shot Officer Humphreys in a leg, and then sat on the pistol. Uh, he did all that while being tased three diff by three different officers and then being shot uh, 26 times. And uh, the community, needless to say, does not uh, share that view that that's what happened to Keaton Otis. So that same year, Portland police killed another young black man in a mental health crisis named Aaron Campbell. Yes. Can you talk about that case as well? Uh, for people who moved here recently, what happened there? Well, uh, three months before Keith Notice was killed, Aaron Campbell's brother died that day. He had been suffering from a kidney failure, and so that day he fought, he died. Um, Aaron Campbell was distraught with the loss of his brother, uh, and uh, in his apartment, um, his girlfriend's mother called Portland police because she said she had been trying to reach her daughter and her daughter wasn't responding. And she was concerned that uh, that Aaron Campbell uh, may have had a weapon and he may have been distraught and wanted the police to go and do a welfare check. When uh, uh, So they did. They, uh, they showed up at uh, uh, um, Aaron Campbell's apartment building. Um, a hostage negotiator was talking to Aaron Campbell. They were texting. Uh, he got Aaron Campbell to let everybody else in the apartment go. He wasn't holding anybody hostage, but there were other people, but they were allowed to leave the apartment. Um, Aaron Campbell started coming out of the apartment, following the officer's orders, coming out backwards with his hands up. A Portland police officer then released his dog, which started biting him on the ankle. So when he moved, uh, another police officer went, oh, uh, uh, and they uh, and uh, he's reaching for a weapon, and uh, so um, Officer McAllister was up on a rooftop uh, and saw him reaching back uh, because first there was a dog, then somebody tased him, uh, and and so he went to go to his back because he he was tased, and so he w put his hand to his back. Police officer, sharpshooter, decided he's reaching for a weapon and shot and killed him. Now the uh, the sad thing about this is the officer that uh, had the rifle and who shot and killed him uh, wasn't even in communications with the officers that were directly at the scene. Those officers said the incident is over, everything's under control, uh, he's coming out, there's no problem. But because that officer chose to take his earplug out, uh, he didn't know that the situation was under control, so therefore he shot and killed Aaron Campbell. And um, as you may know, that officer was fired by Portland Police Bureau, stayed on pay leave for five years as we went through an appeals process and he now is in a Portland police uniform again back on the force all back pay uh, all seniority so it's as if Aaron Campbell was not killed but he was so two years later the US Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the city of Portland based on the police bureau's use of force against mental uh, against people in mental health crises but they didn't call out violence against black people as an issue that the Bureau needed to act on. Right. Uh, 
Why do, why do you think this is? Well, ironically, when the Alabama Ministerial Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform invited the Department of Justice to town, it was specifically to look at what was happening with black boys and men at the hands of Portland police. When the Department of Justice showed up, they did a bait and switch and decided that they would investigate what was happening with people with mental health issues. When we asked them why they did the bait and switch, they had two reasons. One, you may know that at the U.S. Supreme Court, you cannot bring a a case of racially biased treatment unless you can prove intent. And that played out in New York with the stop and frisk. If it wasn't for brave officers recording roll call where they were told to go out and stop black and brown boys and men, uh, stop and frisk would have never stopped in New York. The second reason they told us, which we found more egregious, was the men who had been killed by Portland police who were black all had mental health issues. So the mental health cover would address uh, the African-American people who were killed by the police. As a community activist who has served in the Oregon State Legislature, what do you think is wrong with the police system of accountability in the state and in Portland? And how does it compare to other parts of the country that you're familiar with? Well, I think policing is broken all across the United States of America. I think in Oregon specifically, we cannot pass good legislation to hold police accountable because currently in our legislative body on the judiciary committees are many ex-police officers. And so when you try to pass really good uh, reform measures, for example, there was a body cam bill that was a good bill when it started last legislative session. And when it passed uh, by a unanimous vote of both houses, it was the worst possible bill imaginable because it did just the opposite of holding police accountable. So the bill that the legislative body passed, the police would own the data, the public would have no access to the data, the police would decide what was released to the public, the police could look at the video before they wrote their written report. And so anybody who thinks that we're looking for a accountability in our police would not look at that as a model uh, for an action. What we need uh, in Portland specifically is a really independent police review process. Right now we have a pretend process with the IPR. They don't actually investigate police. They don't hold them accountable and they throw out 74% of complaints they get in every year. So as a community member seeking redress, you cannot get that today unless you can afford a private attorney that's willing to sue Portland Police Bureau. For our listeners, can you talk about what the IPR is? Oh, yes. IPR is the Independent Police Review Division that's out of the auditor's office. Uh, put together by uh, Mayor Vera Katz during her administration that was supposed to replace uh, the past um, oversight body, which was uh, which uh, all the members resigned because they felt that they were not being able to they were not being allowed to do the job that they were hired to do, which was to hold the police accountable. Um, And so the IPR supposedly investigates and uh, uh, police uh, misconduct. But as I said, when you throw out 72%, 74% of the complaints that walk in your door every year and you throw them out because people are houseless, because they're complaining about racially biased treatment, uh, and basically IPR says, well, you know, it's just a he said, she said, right? You say they treated you bad. He says he didn't. We can't do anything about that. And so we have an incompetent system that's set up to pretend that we have over side of police and we don't and so we need to get rid of that pretend system and put a real system in place that's led by the community uh, that has uh, subpoena power that has a budget I mean we could take the IAD the uh, invest the uh, police uh, investigative divisions budget since they don't investigate police well and we could fund a really independent police oversight board and that's what I think we need to do and it doesn't seem to be a matter of Um, availability of funds either, correct? Certainly not. I mean, you know, that's the uh, powers that be will tell us that we don't have the money to put a truly independent police resource in place. But if we took the money from the IPR's budget and took the money from the IAD, which is the internal police uh, uh, investigative unit that is supposed to investigate police and don't, if we took both of those budgets, we'd have significant money for the public to be able to uh, hold police accountable for their behavior. What, in uh, your view, is, I guess, what are some of the biggest obstacles to achieving an independent police review system? Well, the biggest one is police think they do nothing wrong. 
And so how do you correct behavior if you've done nothing wrong? Uh, in the case of Aaron Campbell, in the case of Keith Notice, police officers have not been held accountable. And we have many, many cases in this community of community members. I mean, uh, you think about, uh, I mean, there's so many cases of people that have been killed or harmed by police where there's been no accountability. They haven't been punished. They haven't been fired. Um, so we that we have to fix. I think that's one of our biggest problems. So the biggest problem is the police are going to say, we do nothing wrong. And we know best. And so we don't need any oversight from the public. Uh, The other obstacle is that we have a very incompetent city council that actually refuses uh, to hold the police accountable uh, and to make them responsive to the public. And so we need a new city council. (laughs) We need an independent police uh, process uh, that the public owns. Um, And I have seen, I know that in um, Oakland, California, they did just that. They took the money from the police who were supposed to be doing investigations of police and they actually created a community oversight board that actually is funded uh, by the money that used to go to the police department and they are starting to show results of a very effective community-led oversight body and so I use them as a model of what's possible. Wow well that's reassuring that in some part of uh, I guess this side of the country there's, there's a little bit of hope. There is a little bit of hope. And I mean, in every community is actually responding differently. So depending upon what community you live in, uh, what grassroots people are really pushing policymakers to make changes. Um, and it takes it all. It, you have to have grassroots folks on the street. You got to have policymakers that are willing to hold police accountable. Uh, and you have to. And if not, then we have to be willing to remove those policymakers. I, I feel like we could sit here and talk about this for hours. All day long, but I have a vigil to get to. Yes. <laughs> yes yeah, and that's what I want to bring it back to, uh, bringing it back to keep notice. Yes. Um, what um, what will happen at the vigil tonight, and uh, what can you tell our, our listeners about it? I can tell you that um, the month after... Um, Aaron um, uh, Keith Notice was killed. His dad, Fred Bryant, started this vigil. Um, and his dad, uh, you, as you can imagine, all family members are devastated when their family member is killed uh, by anybody, but especially if they're killed by people who are sworn to protect and serve. And so uh, he started this vigil um, for one hour uh, every month on the day his son was killed from six to seven. Uh, and so tonight uh, we will gather, we will talk about what's happening now at the state of policing. And of course, as you can imagine over the last week, a lot has happened around the country. So we'll be talking about what our next steps are here locally and how we can be supportive of each other. And I wanna also do a shout out to Serge because Serge actually did a fabulous press conference yesterday to en- and encourage people to come to the vigil. And they've done a wonderful job of actually supporting the Keep Notice vigil. And I want to say that Fred Bryant died uh, almost three years ago now, three years ago in October, um, because he his heart gave out in seeking justice for his son. And Walita and I decided that we would keep this vigil going because we made that promise to him. And so as long as we have a breath in our body, every, on the 12th of every month, we're there on that corner.